morning we're going to be looking at the book of Hebrew. And um, the author of the book of Hebrews spends the first ten and a half chapters of the 13 chapters of the book emphasizing the superiority of Jesus Christ and the new covenant um, and comparing that to Moses and the old covenant. In chapters 1 and 2, the writer focuses specifically on the superiority of Christ to angels. Hear the word of the Lord. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he made, had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he had inherited, um, being more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you should care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside of their control. As it is, we do not see yet everything in subjection to them. But we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels and now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their faith perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father, for this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Out of their own life lessons, each of the prophets had discovered a piece of God's revelation for mankind. And the writer of Hebrews wanted us to know that. God, he is the peace in, in the Son of God, he is the peace of truth that God will intervene in human lives. Do you believe that God desires to intervene in your life? Amen? See, we have to ask that question of ourselves first because we sit back and a lot of times we think, well, God, you know, like, you've got really important things to do because you keep the heavens going and, and you keep all of creation in order and, you know, like, thank you that you made me and um, if I get in a lot of trouble, I'm sure you're going to pay attention. But otherwise, God, you've got bigger fish to fry and, oh, you know, I'll just, I'll just step back and just accept where I find myself. And that is not what God has in mind for any of us. Can I tell you that there's nothing that affects your life that God doesn't care about? He is touched with everything that goes on in our lives. Here's how I know. The Son of God gave his life so that we could be connected to the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives and moves and has his being through each one of us. And the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, an exact imprint of the Word, of the heart of the Father. They are all one. They are never different from one another, always the same. And if Christ lives in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the exact imprint of, of Christ, the Son of God, then what exactly hasn't he experienced with you? 
my mother once said to me, she goes, you know, I, 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 you know, every now and then I get a little discouraged as a wife. And I think, God, you never knew what it was like to be a wife. <laughs> and I, I remember looking at her and going like, well, doesn't he live in you? Like, he's living in you. I see him all the time. Does he know what it's like to be a wife? A mother? Yeah, he sure does. Because he is, he has tasted everything that you have tasted. He knows. He knows what your struggles are. He knows what your strongholds are. He knows where your victories are. Come on, somebody get it. He knows. He knows you. He knows you. See, how in the world, Pastor Mary, could God know me and know everybody? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He is God immortal. He is the creator of all things. And he created you. And by the way, he loves you so much that he cries when you cry. He says he collects our tears. Come on. He is acquainted with everything that causes us to cry. He understands. He knows that you and I are going to have to make choices. And he knows how we're going to choose before we even do it. And I believe sometimes that when we make choices that are contrary to his word or contrary to the wisdom that he has given us, it makes him sad. It makes him sad. Why? Because we believe just to a certain level. And God is always going to ask us to rise. Why? Because he is high and lifted up. Amen? He is high and lifted up. He is not going to live on an earthly plane with us. He has been exalted. Scripture says that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. You don't need a different intercessor. You have Jesus. And he's saying, come on, you can do it. You can do this. I believe in you. Come on. I, le I left my spirit with you. You have the power of the Most High living in you. Are you going to appropriate that power or are you going to just ignore it and do things in your own strength to satisfy your own flesh and your, in what you desire? It grieves my heart sometimes, but I, I know in, that in my own life and the lives of the people whom I love dearly, we have all settled at some point in time, we all said, and we go like, well, it doesn't look like it's going to get, I'm not going to really get what my heart desires for, so I'm going to settle over here. And I'll just go ahead and be happy with that. And I don't believe that there's anything scriptural about that. I believe with all my heart, in fact, that it is unscriptural to do that. So many people, they're like, Mary, you live in such an idealistic whatever. You better thank God for that. Because if I was sitting back going like, oh, dear. Oh, my, I don't know what we're going to do. Put on an Eeyore, right? Oh, man. It doesn't look good. You better be happy he made me an idealist. Why? Because he's a perfect and ideal God. Amen? He is an ideal God. He has ideal hopes and dreams for each one of us. And we sit back sometimes and go like, well, I guess I'll just have to settle. I guess I'll just have to settle because, you know, I haven't done things perfect. Would you get over it? If you have invited Jesus into your life, God looks at you and you are flawless from heaven's vantage point, but down here in the world, our goal is to look like Jesus, to have his love imprinted on our, our humanness, amen, so that somebody else will see what an amazing God we serve. And that he really wants to love us with this extravagant grace. And grace is that it's God's riches at Christ's expense. It is truly a miraculous thing that he calls us to. And he says, choose life. I set before you life and death. Choose life. 
Choose it. Don't just settle for some dead thinking. I always come back to that. When I say that, how many of you know that sometimes connected to a verse from the Word of God, you have a memory, and all of a sudden it's just like, bam, it's right there. You know it? And when I say, I choose, I put before you life and death, choose life, my, I can hear my mother talking in my head. I can, I can hear her. And she would say this, Mary, any old dead fish can float downstream, but it takes a lively one to swim up it. <laughs> so be lively. Live in the love of God, Mary, because that's where life is. Live in that place. But how many times do we want to diminish the love of God into something that we understand or, or to dumb it down because that's what we think we deserve? You and I don't deserve anything. We deserve death. Because we can't live sinless this side of glory. But God says, I am enough to raise you out of dead thinking, to lift you up, to help you overcome evil. I am enough. And we sit back and go like, mm, not sure you can do that in my life, God. Right? Well, if you think that way, I'll say this with as much love as I know how to do, you're wrong. You're wrong. Scripture says that his grace is extravagant and that his love for us is unmeasurable and that he is always faithful to those who love him and are called according to his grace. He makes everything work for our good when we love him and are called according to his purpose. And sometimes... We don't look at the things in our life as going to bring about good because we don't feel good in a moment. But that's why faith is so important. And we have to walk by faith beyond what we feel and beyond what we see and beyond what we know in the natural to go like, I know, I see, I get it, but God, you said. And I'm going to stand in that spot. And I'm going to wait for your salvation because what I ask for is what you have already said you would give to me, God. You would provide for me. Whatever it is you need today, he wants to get it to you. But you've got to put on a spirit of gratitude, let praise come out, and walk by faith. That's your word today. Because he wants to imprint you with his love. And he wants you to shine for him in a world full of dead thinking. See? It really isn't that difficult, but we hate the suffering part. Oh, God, I don't want to suffer. I don't like it either. But here's what always keeps me going. And it's, some days it's hard. i got to be honest with you. Some days it's a challenge, you know, and I'm like, God... You know, like, this is such a difficult place for me today. And God says to me, give it to me. Just hand it off. And that seems so simplistic, doesn't it? You go like, really? Hand it off. Thank me. Praise me. I'm working on it. Keep going. Keep going. Because I want to show you, I'm going to show you, how much I love you. I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm determined to love you, Mary. The other day I went in and we were, I was, Friday I was buying some paint and my husband had picked up some paint and had it mixed at a location and they had trouble mixing it and they kept adding this and that to it and it didn't end up having a formula at the end of it. It was just like a color that they had you know, mixed a bunch of stuff together. And, and so I wanted to paint more of that color, and I went up to Home Depot, and I, I asked the gal there if she could match it, and she goes, I think so. And 
she uses this computer thing, she comes back and it is so not the right color. <laughs> and 30 minutes had gone by by this time. And you know me, I'm... <laughs> That's not you though, is it? <laughs> so, uh, I, then the representative of the paint company was there and he came over and he goes, well, you know, I'm so sorry, it's been a while. And he goes, I'd like to try it, you know, may, may I try, you know, mixing it myself? And I said, okay. And he mixes it and he comes over and he said, I just, you know, I just want to thank you for being patient because by this time, an hour, I'm standing there an hour. He goes, I just want to thank you. And I wanted, and I looked, at, and <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, well, I'm a pastor of a church and it sure wouldn't look good if somebody knew that I was ranting and raving at the paint <laughs> counter. <laughs> then I'm going to talk to the people about their love walk, right? You know what I mean? It's like, it was just like Jesus saying to me, Mary, just come, just love them. It's all going to be good. You know, you're going to get, so brought the paint back. My friend Ray and I were looking at the container of paint. He goes, as only Ray could do, girl, there's something wrong with this paint. <laughs> and I just went like, yeah. <laughs> and then I went, oh, you know, it's going to be okay because I was patient. God's going to make it work for good, right, you know. And once the paint went on the wall, it actually looked just like it. And I had to laugh. I was laughing. I la it actually put such a spark in my heart all day because I thought to myself, God, you know, like in the can, it looked like one color, and on the wall, it looked like another, and it had them in God. <laughs> Come on, somebody get it. <laughs> somebody get it. He rewarded me. I'm standing there. I'm standing for an hour. I got a million things I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get back to get some stuff done. And God just says, I'm going to make you rest by green pastures, Mary. Just take a deep breath. You know? And it's so funny because about maybe no less than seven people came in and got their paint and then left. And I'm still standing there. And they're looking at me like, can they help you? I'm like, you know, <laughs> it's okay, right? I choose life. Amen. And I choose love. And I don't do it as well as I want to, but I work at it every day. When we work at our salvation, we're seeing God, do in me what you can do because nobody else can do it. I can't do it for myself. I want to walk in your love. I want to walk in the wisdom of what love looks like. Help me, God. Help me. Help me to really pay attention to the areas where there's life and to the areas that are dead in my life. And help me just to stay focused on what you're doing every day in my life. Because if I trust you, your word says, when I trust you and I hold fast by faith of what you say you're going to do, which is the extraordinary for this ordinary person. When you, you have said you're going to do that, I want to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think, Mary. Stand in that place. I'm going to stand there as best I can with God's help. Amen? Amen? And you and I need to do the same thing. One of my dear friends, um, Father John, he was a Catholic priest who got married, and some of you know him, but he has put an imprint of love on my heart several times, and when he's in town, he comes and he joins us in worship here. But I wanted to read something he sent to me because it perfectly describes where we find ourselves. The name of it is, There Are Two Seas. There are two seas in Palestine. One is fresh, fish are in it, splashes of green adorn its banks. Trees spread their branches over it and stretch out their thirsty roots to sip of its healing waters. Along its shores the children play as children played when he was there. He loved it there. He could look across its silver surface when he spoke his parables. And on the rolling plain, not far away, he fed 5,000 people. The River Jordan makes this sea with a sparkling water from the hills. Men build their houses near to it, and birds build their nests 
and every kind of life is happier because it is there. The River Jordan flo flows on south to another sea, and here is no splash of fish, no fluttering leaf, no songbirds, no children's laughter. Travelers choose another route unless, oh, on urgent business. The air hangs heavy above its water, and neither man nor beast nor fowl will drink of its water. What makes this mighty difference in the neighboring seas? The river doesn't make a difference. It's still the Jordan River. It empties the same good water into both, not the soil in which they lie. It's not the soil, and it's not the country that's around about it. This is the difference. The Sea of Galilee receives but does not keep the Jordan. For every drop that flows into it, another drop flows out. The other sea is shrewder, bordering its income jealously. It will not be tempted into any uh, generous impulse. Every drop it gets, it keeps. The Sea of Galilee gives and lives. This other sea gives nothing. And its name is the Dead Sea. There are two seas in Palestine. And there are two kinds of people in the world. Be a life-giving, love-imprinted son and daughter of the Most High God. Amen. A while ago, I found this on my desk. It's been a um, couple of months, I think. I mean, it could be longer because I lose track of time and have such a good time every day, right? And I found this, and it's imprinted on the back, and it says, I am grateful. I am grateful. I want to tell you something. There's a huge gift of God in power for a grateful heart. Amen? And if you will hold on to your gratitude to God for everything that he has done for you, is doing for you, and will do for you in the future, you will find yourself walking in a lot more victory. Amen? Start putting your thoughts and your ways high up there. Stop living down in this, uh, this, this one area down in here, which is just the status quo. I hate status quo. And anybody that knows me goes like, oh, don't say that word around Pastor Mary. She's going to change something, right? But when I see people just kind of plateauing, I'm going to do something. Why? Because I know you can have more of God because on this side of heaven, we are always going to be able to receive. Amen? Amen. And if we aren't grateful for what we got, why should God give us any more? So, turn to your neighbor and say, I am going to be grateful. I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to be grateful. <laughs> And here you go. I want you to start focusing on gratitude so much that it's the first thing out of your mouth in the morning. I thank you, God, for this, and I thank you, God, for that, and I am grateful for this, and I am grateful for that. And I know you're working on the stuff that's bothering me, but I am grateful. I am grateful. I'm going to be grateful today. I'm going to talk about being grateful. I'm going to let my neighbor know I'm grateful. I'm going to keep going on that grateful path. So, amen. So, to help you to live in the gratitude, We've got a grateful tree, all right? It's a spirit of gratefulness. And I want you to stop and I want you to, every time God leaves something in your heart for which to be grateful, I want you to write it down on a leaf and put it on the tree. And I want you to remember what he has done for you because he put his whole life on a tree for you. Just put a few leaves on that one to praise him, amen? You go be a blessing to somebody today and you make them be grateful too. 